It's Brian Preston, the money guy. And here's the thing. When you have a 30-year retirement, you can handle a few bumps and bruises and even market volatility. Absolutely. But man, does it look different when it's a 50-year plus retirement. I think that's so interesting. On a 30-year time frame, bumps and bruises are just that. On a 50-year time horizon, a, a bump or a bruise could mean like having to cut off a limb. It can be that severe over that long of a time period. Well, it's not even just market gyrations. Because let's face it, when you retire when you're 60 plus, Mm -hmm. you probably have already bought your final house. You probably know what you want out of life. You've had all your children. You got them out of the nest, most likely. A lot of life has already occurred. Sure. When you retire in your 30s, 40s, and even 50s, there's a lot of life. It's not just the volatility of the marketplace. It's also the life that you have to that you're building for yourself as you're making it through the journey. Uh, there was actually someone out there in the financial world who we're familiar with, uh, pretty popular out there in the fire movement, and he had an article that came out. I think it was in December of last year. Mm-hmm. Is that right? And this is what it said. It said, "As a 42 year old millionaire, I tried to retire early at 34, but failed." Here's what went wrong. So I think I think this is pretty. I love it when people are self-reflective mm-hmm. and kind of look at this is financial samurai. A lot of you guys have, if you're in the fire movement, you followed Sam for years. Yep. He, he writes good content, um, and you can see he's now. It, it's so interesting because he's out there on the West Coast. Yep. And I think when, when he started out, he had a portfolio of over three million dollars in assets. And he and he originally when he was 34 years of age. This seemed like it was going to be enough. Mm -hmm. But Sam has come out and been very transparent that he might have missed a few things when he actually left at 34 to the point that he's now back in the workforce at 42. What are those big learning experiences he had? Yeah, so obviously you can go read the article, but we kind of pulled out. Here are some of the things he said that really affected his FIRE plan. Number one, he had a child. I can't in my mind fathom thinking about being in retirement off the workforce, completely relying on my portfolio before kids even entered in the equation. Because when you have a kid, things just change financially and otherwise. Life is very different, at least in my perspective, post-child than it was pre-child. It reminds me of the, the famous Mike Tyson quote that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the That's mouth. That's right, yep. It's kind of the same way everybody has a plan until you have a kiddo. Yep. And then you realize, man... These things cause a lot of chaos. They so just be do. prepared. Children change things. The second thing that Sam noted is that he underestimated how low interest rates would go. Yeah. This is something that we as financial advisors have had to be very, very careful of because we tell clients right now, they're thinking, hey, should I refinance or what's going to happen to my savings account or where should I put my cash? And we say, look, we know that historically rates are really, really low right now, but no one has a crystal ball. Certainly Sam did not have his crystal ball pre-retirement, nor do we have ours now. So the financial markets can do some things that we might not expect. Yeah, and this is a big thing. And I know why Sam put this on there is because for retirees, you're counting on yield. This Mm -hmm. is how you're supposed to get safe returns is from you know, having bonds and and your savings accounts generate some yield on the interest that they're paying you. You don't have to take a lot of risk and you can build some income coming in every year. The problem also, here's the second bad side of this, is when people cannot get yield out of their safe investments, what do they do? They tiptoe further out on the risk spectrum. Absolutely. And that, you know, that's great when you're getting return. It's very scary when you have the volatility of a down market. I think COVID uh, brought a lot of that to light for folks. Because I think you said it so beautifully. They tiptoe. No one ever plans, oh, I'm going to go further out on the risk spectrum, further out. But you have three, four, five years of really solid market performance and you're not rebalancing appropriately. You might not even realize how much more aggressive your portfolio is than it should be. So that's a huge thing you have to be aware of. The third thing that Sam noted was rising health insurance premiums. He had sort of budgeted, hey, this is how much I think healthcare would cost in retirement, and it changed. Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, this is something we've noticed. Look, I'm going to tell you, this is a true concern for anybody who's retiring early. I'm talking about somebody who's in their 50s, 55, 60, even 62 years of age, because you do not qualify for Medicare until you reach 65. And that's what a lot of people, I mean, you can be a great saver, a great accumulator of wealth, but if you don't have your health insurance, it gets a little scary. Now look, 
We know when um, the Affordable Care Act was passed, yep. it actually seemed like it was going to be a lifeline mm -hmm. for early retirees. Well, the cost is expensive. The exchanges, like I know here in Tennessee, we ran into a lot of problems where just a lot of the insurance providers opted they out opted of even out. offering right. coverage on the exchange in Tennessee. It hasn't been everything we had hoped, but I do, I have optimism. I'm always a glass half full. I'm hopeful that health insurance becomes something that you can get in the future without necessarily working for an employer. Now, all three of these, in my mind, were sort of quantitative, right? Mm -hmm. They were, you know, you can, they were dollars and cents. This fourth reason, Sam said he had to unretire. The bliss of early retirement didn't last as long as he thought it would. Yeah. We all have these visions, especially we're in our 20s and 30s, of thinking, man, I'm just so ready to not have to show up to work and not have to work up early and not have to deal with that boss and duh, 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 duh. Well, a lot of times it's like the dog that chases the car. Once you catch the car, you got to figure out, all right, what do I do with this now? I think it's interesting. Now, look. I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys I have a bias for you. Mm -hmm. And you probably saw me looking over my shoulder. We actually have a book over here called Tap Dancing to Work. Yep. It's about Warren Buffett, you know, and he, he, he loves what he does mm -hmm. for a living. I am in that same camp as I know that I am doing what I was put on this earth to do. Sure. So I do have a bias in that, but I do think that a lot of us, we've seen this in our happiness studies. When we've done shows on what creates happiness and where's the intersection between your financial life and your happy life, the purpose of your work, meaning that if you are getting fulfillment, if you feel like in your own small way, you're making the world a better place by waking up and going to work, it does give you that fulfilled, purpose-filled yep. life. And it's one of those things that I think people underestimate. So be careful and make sure, even if you are part of the FIRE movement, while you're working, make sure it's work that you enjoy. Now, and don't, don't mishear us. Uh, there are a lot of folks who say, I do want to check out of the workforce. So I want to travel the world and do all those things. And that's great. Nothing wrong with that. What we would encourage you to think about, and we tell retirees this all the time, is don't just think about what you are retiring from. Know exactly what it is you are retiring to, whether that be laying on the beach or volunteering or a second career. That is especially true of fire movement folks because you have a lot longer to retire to someone than a traditional retiree. I think that's a great point. We have some clients that have actually fire participants mm -hmm. retired in their 40s. And the ones that have done it the best already kind of have the backup plan that's figured exactly out. Right. I mean, we have, if you ever come do an office tour, you're going to see some crazy pictures. I mean, we have um, we have a client who is my age, uh -huh. but he makes me feel bad about myself when I look at his pictures because he's he's actually lifeguarding, playing Dev David Hasselhoff. That's exactly right. Um, is his you know backup very yep. successful executive career, and now he's a lifeguard. Good for him. And I he mean, loves he kind of knows the beach where he went to. Doing that. So we thought these were four uh, poignant points that Sam put in his article. But we thought, you know, just from our exp experience, there are some other honorable mentions worth noting. Uh, the first one, you know, Sam had said, hey, I had a kid and it changed things. I'd argue for a lot of retirees, it's not just the front end of having a kid. It's the entire time a kid is living in your house because we have cars and colleges and after school activities and all the things if you're trying to check out early, there is some wild variability in what your kids have going on until they're truly out of the nest. When I read this, I was like, Sam, you haven't seen nothing yet. Because he, <laughs> he was complaining about the $2,000 a month daycare mm -hmm. and preschool type yep. expenses. It's like, oh, just wait, Sam. Mm -hmm. it, it gets even more um, from there. So kiddos are definitely something yep. you got to take into account. The next one I thought that was interesting is housing. Now, mm -hmm. this is something uh, I think back to 25-year-old Bo Hansen. If 25-year-old Bo Hansen was going to name early retirement and what that would look like, it will have looked very different than what in his mid-30s Bo Hansen actually knows it would need because housing was different. What made sense for me and my wife was like a sleeper sofa and a kitchen and a bathroom. What makes sense now for our family of four is very different than that. So you have to recognize as life changes, so too do your preferences on what you can accept for housing and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's a it's a... Very notable difference. If you're retiring for 50 plus years, there's going to be a lot of life that will mm -hmm. evolve. It's not just the kiddos. It's just that your taste and your desires and what actually brings you fulfillment might evolve as well. That's right. Uh, and the other honorable mention that I thought was so interesting, I wonder if we were to interview Sam and say, hey, Sam, when you were doing your early retirement planning, 
Did you account for the fact that in the year 2020, there was going to be a global viral outbreak that was going to have a huge pandemic and the world economy was going to shut down and people weren't going to be able to leave their homes and people were going to lose their jobs? Was that built into your plan? And I just have a feeling he's going to say, no. Well, nobody has. I mean, here's the thing. Over the next decade, there will be two, three, maybe even four events nobody will foresee. I mean, you can make a plan. But plans are never going to be 100% That's because right. you just don't know all the variables. You don't know what inflation is going to be. You don't know what market returns are going to be. So you have to just kind of craft a plan. And this is actually a great setup as we get into case, case studies. That's right. Is you try to take into all the data you do know that even accounts for all the unforeseen circumstances of the past. Mm-hmm. So we can try to figure out what gives me the highest probability of making it through no matter what this crazy world throws at me. That's right. So that leads to, let's kind of talk about case studies. Probability of success matters when we're talking Mm -hmm. about financial independence, when you're retiring early with FIRE. Um, And here's, I was surprised as we started doing prep on with the case studies, I have never seen retirement scenarios that had a 0% chance of success. I mean, all of my retirement meetings I've yep. been in in my, I mean, I'm in my third decade of doing financial planning. I've never seen zero potential of success. Yeah. So when we started running some of these, hey, I want to exit at 35 and I need this level of, of living expense. It wasn't like, oh, well, you need the best market ever to make this work. It was, no, there is a 0% chance this money will last you. So the end of your life, uh, if you're entertaining a scenario that even has that sort of opportunity, it should cause you to pause and think for a second, man, what, what am I actually looking at here? Yeah, so that's why it's important. We do this for all of our clients. You got to stress test the plan. Mm-hmm. You yep. got to, what, what are you not accounting for and how do I get it in there? And then also, here's something I want to warn you guys because I, I have enough clients and I've looked in enough forums that I worry a little bit about fire, mm-hmm. p- participants of fire, and the fact that you get you in your own little echo chamber. Okay. Meaning that you go out there and you go to this forum, you go to this blog, they get you all hyped up and excited about the movement that you joined, that it can kind of be nudging you in a direction and creating some blind spots of things you might not have even accounted for. Yeah, I think one of the things you said is as you think about early retirement, exiting the workforce, a lot of folks don't realize that depending on your vocation, your career, that path may just be one way. Yeah. So it's um. So here's what I also, this is the last thing. And this is, take this because we're all shaped by the life we grew up mm-hmm. in. I grew up, a lot of, anybody who's been watching the show long enough, you know that my father lost his job in his early 40s. I think he was 42, 43 years of age. He had a mid-level management job. They got out of that market and basically just did an apple cart turnover of all their employees. It is hard as a mid-40-year-old to go out there and get back into the workforce. So for you to voluntarily leave, choose that you're going to leave your job to retire, make sure you measure twice, cut once, because here's what I'm worried about. You're leaving the party. If we think about the visualization of your cycle of earning potential over your life expectancy mm-hmm. and the years that you're in the workforce. If, if we're thinking about this in terms of an analogy of a good party, you've essentially gotten to the party. It took a few years for, you know... The good songs to keep the good, in. The cool kids to show up, the DJ to start playing your favorite songs, and, you know, and it's starting to heat up a little bit. Right as it heats up, right as the party is starting to kind of gel... You're like, well, guys, I'm out. This is great, (laughs) but I think I've had enough. I'm out of here. And you leave. And what I mean by that is that this is the the years of your working career that you make peak maximum money. You build the size of your shovel for building assets. You're actually tapping out. So if you retire at 35, you haven't even climbed the mount all the way. If you're leaving at 45, still not there, you know, because a lot of peak earning years are 50 to 55 years of age. Yeah, what I think is beautiful about this illustration that Daniel put together is this shows the median income in this country. And then it shows kind of where the, if you're in the lower income brackets, if you're in the 25% of income, or if you're in the 75% of income, you're in the higher income bracket, which ages it kind of peaks. I thought it was interesting. All of them 
tend to peak in that 40 to 60 year range. If you're someone who's exiting early, there is a lot of opportunity cost that's going to be left on the table. And that's one of the things we'll kind of talk through in our case studies. So it is worth repeating, measure twice, cut once, because it might be harder. It might be a one-way street. So just make sure if you are leaving the workforce, you don't assume it's going to be so easy to come right back into it.